Check. Check. Okay. Uh, Dan, say, ask that question or tell me, tell me what Chris told you so really Chris loudly. Wanted a, a zip, or not a zip, or just the, the entire site code, everything. Yeah, which is incorrect. Surprise. So, uh, Cornholio is uh, giving you incorrect information. I like Cornholio, don't get me wrong. I do, that's why I call him Cornholio. Um, but here's what I want, okay? So, end of uh, week two, choose a project site, right? Client staging area, et cetera, et cetera. So, if I go to spring 2017, and go to Christopher Cornwell's, right? Template home, I should be able to see it. Code repository. I don't need all this stuff, Chris. All I need is template main HTML, template home HTML, that then if we look at his template, it then links to a bootstrap CSS, jQuery CSS, uh, and a couple of his CSS files. Because what we're going to do is when we try to access the CSS file, that's where we're going to start using WordPress's stuff. So to go back to his repository, yeah, I don't need all of these files, Chris. Why did you do that? So if you're watching this, you no, man just this one, that one, and your CSS files. However, I would recommend that you do not put your CSS files in its own CSS folder because uh, what's going to happen is we are going to, so if I look at then the choose your project site and we go to my example here. If I go to view the templates for code, styles is in the root directory. WordPress wants to have the style sheets in the root directory okay. with all the other files. That's the way uh, WordPress default type works. So if you do have it in a separate CSS file, Right, you probably should move it out when you create your templates into uh, being at the same level as your HTML files. When you say create templates, I noticed this file is already named template there. Um, when I was when remember I was that Chris did his wrong. Okay, well, uh, mostly so wrong. I'm just trying to clarify. I know. I have I have a project. Uh -huh. I have a main, my front page and the secondary page Correct. that I have identified that I'm bringing in. Correct. But they're just the way they were when I built that stack. Possibly. Did you use PHP includes? Yeah. Well, they they do use PHP. Right. Includes. I don't want them to have PHP includes. So put that stuff back in the, the what's the include file. Correct-ish. So again, here's here's what you're going to do, right? Follow closely, because I feel like I've said this over and over and over again to everybody, okay? If you have a project like what I used was my final prototype out of the 532 class, okay? So if we look at the final code in that class, it is broken into PHP files that have include files, right? So if I go to about.php, include header, include footer. What I want is this. Home, no includes, just straight up HTML, right? So therefore, if you have a site like this that you have broken up into PHP includes, 
that you are going to be using. Fantastic. Here's what I want you to do. View page source, select all, copy, new file, save this as home.html. That's how you're going to be making your template files. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So everybody got that? So all the proofs will be included. Right? So this is the easy way to go back to raw HTML, no includes. Because what we're going to do then is we're going to take your template file, save it as index.php, and start building a theme out of it. Make sense? And okay. change the references to the CSS files. Correct. So the reference to the CSS file, <laughs> styles.css, actually we're going to change that to style.css. Right? And then that pathway, for those of you that are at home, right? And I'm going to see the population in here decrease. Because I know you guys just want to watch all this at home and not be in class. I know you guys. And this is one of those classes that you can totally do that. But just know that if you don't show up, I'm going to heckle you on video. It's harder to read the screen. Okay. So yeah, we'll we'll replace that sheet with the blog info function that then uh, says go get the style sheet. Make sense? So. That being said, if we look into, no, so if we look at then here this template structure that I created like that, where I went and I copied my view source from my home.html, right? Currently then, If I go to my documents folder, my web 170 folder, currently this template system is outside of my WordPress install. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. So once you get your template system made as its own little ball, right? You can then, how many of you have installed WordPress so far? Okay, great. Relatively easy. The template system is yes, it was. Okay. Uh, the two files and the CSS file. Correct. So the template system then, if we look here, home.html, main.html, styles.css, you might want to do yourself a favor and just name it style.css, because that's the WordPress name that they want for their default style sheet. And then any scripts, any images, any fonts. Right, so just like a normal site, if you had a flex slider, right, or if you had, you know, any of your images that you're using for whatever, right, any fonts that you were using, right, package that up, and then here's the thing, what you're going to do. So in the WordPress folder here, we have themes, okay? So today, well, let's go to the, the, the what's due by the end of next week. So by the end of the next week, install and set up WordPress is due and create your template files is due. So install and set up WordPress. Download, upload, install the WordPress application, connect to your database, just like we did, right? This WordPress install is what you are going to link to as your view prototype link. 
So if we go back then to spring 2017, and we call Chris, protosite. Nope, he's just linking to his templates for right now. So if we go to my little staging area, if I go to view protosite, this is gonna go to the WordPress install, okay? Create your template files. Again, for your templates, you will need to create a main.html, home.html, style.css, okay? Upload it as your GitHub repository, so on and so forth. Because then what you're gonna do is, when we get to, let's talk about um, the lecture for today. So we did installing WordPress to your server, setting up and customizing WordPress options. Do I have any quick questions on those? Pretty straightforward so far, right? Things are gonna get more exciting, don't worry. Installing and using a pre-developed WordPress theme, okay? So when we start talking about themes, okay? Can I ask a quick question? You can. Um, for the CSS folder, you don't, you don't want the styles that CSS in the folder, right? But do you want the flex slider in the, in the folder or? It's all up to you how you want to manage it. I'm just saying that when you, for the, for the style sheet specifically. Outside right. Now, I, I put my style sheet for flex slider at the same root as everything else, just because I've always had trouble with pathing issues when I put a style sheet in its own folder, okay. okay? And especially when, because where this theme is actually gonna live, so if I go to then my remote server and I look at my demo WordPress install, WP content, themes demo, okay? So my demo theme, that actually does live Under this pathway, right? So that style sheet then is all the way there. So the pathing that you're kind of used to, just putting it in a subfolder and then kind of doing the dot dot slash to go back, whatever, you might run into pathing issues because it's not just one folder you have to go back. Yeah, see what I'm saying? So that's why, I mean, it can be done, right? But that's why I have a tendency to put my style sheets just at the root of where all the other template files live. What is your pattern? Yeah, 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 because I run into issues like that. Okay, thank you. One more yeah, absolutely. So Good question. question. If our original project had multiple CSS files, uh -huh. so it might have something for Lightbox and uh -huh. stuff, do they all get rolled into one? Correct. No, they all get, so that's, that's similar to in my templates here. I have flexslider.css and style.css. So they all just need to be with the, in the same level as your... Correct, because it, it's just easier that way if they're at the root. Now, you will see themes where they put stuff in a CSS folder, mm -hmm. right? But they have to do some extra configuration just for you guys while you're getting started. Start simple and then get complex later on. So does that make sense, Ron? Yep, yep. 
Okay, so here's the thing then. If I have my Web170 Spring 1702 template folder here, if I want to install this as a theme, right, I can simply take this and put it into my themes folder. I'm not going to update the links like Dreamweaver wants me to, right? But you are going to end up putting this in your themes folder, okay? And then shooting that up to the server. I will answer your question like this. We go to demo and we go to style.css. WordPress is going to look for this. We're not there yet. So we have put this theme. Now that's a really important question. It's a question that you're onto something. We're not there yet. But what we just did was we put that template file system into our themes folder that we are then going to make that into a theme. So essentially we just install the theme. But if we now go to my Spring 1702 install. Oh look, I'm already logged in. And I go to my themes directory in my admin. Oh, I guess I'm not logged in. You don't see that theme here. What you see is broken theme, Web 170, Spring 02, style sheet is missing. Style sheet is not actually missing, but what is missing is this call right here, because that is going to be the hook then that the WordPress application looks for in your style sheet to present that theme into the admin as a theme. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so we just installed the theme, it just happens to be a broken theme. So that, that doesn't actually specify the name, so we, we it does. does. Theme name, Mike Sinkula's WordPress demo. Oh, okay. Author, Mike Sinkula, Premium Design Works. Author URI, premiumdw.com, description. This is my demo theme for the Web 170 WordPress class. So therefore, if I logged into Again, we're gonna in this class. We're, Mike is gonna play the game of how many WordPress websites can he log into? There's what seventy million of them out there. So. Uh, I have about thirty million of my own. Yeah. So here is my WordPress demo, the original one that I built for this class, right? So if I go into themes then, you will see Mike Sinkula's WordPress demo. This name right there is being pulled here, okay? So if I said, Now, I just, my eyes are too right. I wasn't parsing that so if I said, sup, Ron. 
Do I really need to prepare to upload or can you just upload it? I mean, really, you know. So if I refresh now, see what I'm saying? Okay. So if I've logged into my WordPress Spring 2017 Section 2 demo, what I want to do is I want to install a new theme. So you know how to do it. There are three different ways of installing a new theme. One, go to the Add New button. See what's featured, what's popular, what's the latest. Brilliant it is. Why? Because the name is brilliant. Why, uh, why was the melon couple sad? Have you heard that before? Yes. You have? Okay, I thought I made that up a couple nights ago. Because they can't elope. No, 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 no. That's what I just said. What do you call, what type of dog likes to eat cantaloupe? A melancholy. Huh? Huh? So what I just did was I installed Brilliant. So Brilliant now shows up here, and if I activate it, and I go and I view, visit my website. This is the brilliant theme. Here is my sample page. Uh, we go back to the home page. There is the sample uh, posting, okay? So essentially that's how you can um, install a pre-existing theme that you find through the WordPress archives, right? right? Well, you can, let's say, this website, Leveraging Smart. This was originally done by using a theme, South Central WordPress theme by High Grade Lab. Okay, so here is the South Central theme. It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly bloated. Looks nice, right? Um, but here's the thing with pre-existing themes. We use South Central, that theme originally here. For some reason, when, I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden the theme broke when something got updated somehow. And that was at the time when I was stopping freelancing work. So I put Mark on this. Mark couldn't figure out how to fix it. So this theme broke. The slider has been missing for like almost a year now. And he's not savvy enough to fix it. He was supposed to uh, send an email to the theme company, High Grade Lab. I don't know whatever happened, right? 
but uh, when you are, so when I was working on this artistguide.net website and the leveraging smart website, basically what happened was this guy, Lauren Wiseman, who I met up in Queen Anne at a coffee shop up in Queen Anne years and years and years ago. Um, I started doing a little bit of freelance work for him. Last I heard, I think he's living in Florida. I haven't actually physically seen him and I don't know when, probably eight years or so. Um, but I was doing a lot of remote freelance work for him where he basically bought this pre-existing theme called South Central and said, pop this logo into it. We want these pages. We want this. And slowly but surely, we just he would put out a bullet list of what he wanted. I would do that bullet list of what he wanted. He would critique it and send me another bullet list of things to do, et cetera. So it was just kind of an ongoing week by week to-do list of creating this website for him. He paid me thousands and thousands of dollars a couple of years ago, right? So I, for doing this Leveraging Smart and the Artist Guide and a couple other projects for him like that, that was nothing more than here's the theme, this is the content we want into it, build it for us so then we can start putting in our blog postings and content. I must have charged him like $10,000 one year just for doing that kind of stuff, right? $60 an hour for just doing WordPress production. I didn't write a whole lot of code. I modified their code a little bit. But again, a lot of those themes can be really, really super bloated. They're slow uh, and they will get screwed up, right? So in terms of what we're teaching you to do here at Seattle Central, we're teaching you to design and build custom websites like in the 200 class the taco truck website that came out really good, right? You built all that from scratch, right? Fantastic, right? Are you using that project in this class? Good, 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 right? So if you build your own theme, it's gonna be a lot slimmer. It's what you're, you are gonna be able to customize it, right? The way you want to um, versus dragging and dropping a whole lot of stuff. Um, I'm not gonna log into this dashboard and show you behind it. Just know that it's really convoluted and complex and just lots of bells and whistles that you don't really need, right? But you can streamline the themes and have the client only be able to upload the text and pictures that they should be uploading and stuff, right? So you can have a lot more control on them not breaking things. Because rule number one about WordPress, wait, rule number one was don't, don't edit WordPress core Rule number two was don't edit WordPress core. Number three is your client's going to break. They're just going to screw something up because it's a content management system that they can't. Okay? But nonetheless, if you want to then go and purchase a theme like this, or if your client wants to, or whatever, You can go and purchase one for, you know, 60 bucks or so, add it to cart, buy it, and download it as a zip file, okay? So if you download it as a zip file, let's just go to, um, wordpress.org. And we can go to their themes that, again, uh, a lot of, so these are the free themes that a lot of uh, designers and developers make for whatever reason they want to make them. I don't know. But uh, business, light, sure, why not? Okay. I mean, look at these people. You'd hire them, right? I mean, come on. That's money right there. <laughs> Thanks for laughing, Sylvia. So if I download this, right, download it as a zip file, in my downloads, business light, right, I can then 
go into my spring 27 dashboard. I can go to themes. I can say add new. And I can upload theme, choose file. So here you can see if you have a theme in zip format, you can install it here. So business light, open, install now. Theme installed successfully, return to themes page. So now here's business light, activate. Hmm. Look at that, it's, it's uh, wants you to also, it looks like it has plugins that are dependencies. So if I activated this again, uh, what I would do would, let's see where that link is gonna take me. recommended maybe it isn't you know total dependencies right some some come with their own plugins that they install like that South Central installed a whole bunch of um, uh, plugins like the the editor thing whatever WP bakery something I can't remember what it was right but now if I visit the site let's see if business what it looks like, yeah. Oh, that doesn't look like uh, what I wanted it to do, right? This probably, this theme here, to get that home page the way, it probably wants me to then, um, let's see, let's go into the business lights and let's see if it has a readme yep so a lot of uh, themes will come with installation instructions right to to fully customize it so it's to to make it all work it's not just as easy as install this theme and you're good to go you're going to have to customize and have to you know, do, do a lot of work to, to get it up and running successfully, right? Um, but yeah, like, so that South Central one, you know, came with a README and it had a whole bunch of other plugins that it wanted to install and, and stuff like that. Uh, it was really, really bloated as well. Or, you know, this one looks like it's a little bit bloated, not a whole lot. Here they have their CSS files. Nope, they got their main style at the root and then an editor style in a CSS folder, right? Um, I'm gonna go back here though, and I'm gonna go back and activate Brilliant because that looks like it's a pretty simple theme. Because what I want you guys to do is for a little while, as we're putting content into your website, as we're uh, creating pages and postings with Laura Mipsum copy and stuff and setting up the menu systems, you're gonna need a front end theme like this to see what you're doing. You can just use the default um, 2015, 16, 17 themes for right now until we start customizing your, your start, start building out your theme, right? Um, but for right now, you can see in this one sample page, which when we um, basically did the install, our WordPress demo comes with a sample posting, which if you look up here is P equals one, posting one, host type, post number one, host object one, sample page. Page ID two, 
right? So now what we want to talk about is plugins, okay? So let's go back here though. Step one, or installing using a pre-developed WordPress theme. Step one, download a pre-developed theme. Uh, you can get them from all over the interweb. You can pay for some of them. A lot of them are free. Um, you get what you pay for. Just let's say it like that, right? But you know, if you have a company that they've bought a pre-existing theme and they want you to be your Word, their WordPress monkey for sixty dollars an hour, um, that beats mowing lawns for five dollars an hour in one hundred and twenty degree heat, right? I mean, it's still within the industry. You know, I didn't feel that good about what I was doing, but I did like the money that was coming in. I do. I like cashing the checks. You know. And, uh, you know, yeah, I like eating, having a roof over my head, right? Hot water. So you can install a pre-developed theme by adding new, right? Um, uploading a zip file or going and looking at featured or popular themes, right? What was the third way to install one of these new so the third way is if you unzip it, is just put it into the themes folder like we I just did with my templates, right? If I was installing a pre-existing theme for WordPress, most likely I would download a zip file and upload the zip file through the admin is how I would do it. If I was building my own theme, I would just start with my template structure, putting that into my themes folder, and then building that out as a theme like we're gonna do in this class. Make sense, Ron? Yep. Okay, so those are the three ways. Just had a slide in my notes for three ways. Sure, 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 sure. And that's similar for, now we're gonna talk about plugins, right? So same thing, you can put a plugin into the plugins folder, you can go find it through the admin or download a zip file, okay? So let's talk about what plugins do. If you have now done a WordPress install the way we've done it, uh, let's say it like this. Did anybody cheat and do a one-click install via DreamHost? No? If you do cheat and do a one-click install through DreamHost, there's going to be some other plugins that it installs for you. There's going to be some other themes that it installs for you. If you are using um, a web hosting service like, not GoDaddy, um, HostMonster, I think, is one, or... Gator host or host gator. There's a host gator, right? Yeah. yeah. They have like their own plugins that they install doing the one click install and that kind of stuff as well. But if we went to then back to our dashboard and we took a look at plugins, well, what are plugins? Uh, plugins are self contained applications that do exactly what the name implies. They are plug-in applications to your admin, right? Or to your WordPress site. So let's take a look at now the two plugins that come with WordPress when you do the download, uh, upload type of install. Akismet, anti-spam. So, this is an anti-spam plugin um, that how it works, I don't exactly know, but I'm imagining that because it is developed by WordPress, in other words, if you see something by automatic, that is, the, those are the developers of WordPress, okay? Um, so, it probably has a database of spam, you know, IP addresses, email addresses, URLs, etc. So, in other words, when we mark something as spam, right? So for instance, if we go to my 
school website and log in. That's not how I spell my name. And I go to my plugins, right? Um, you can see that I have a lot of different plugins running, right? But if we go back to the dashboard here, it says Acasmet has protected your site from uh, 385, 111 spam comments already. Oh, look, I have two in moderation. Eric, and Jay Wan. Should I approve those? Jay Wan, you want to be approved? Yeah. If I go to spam, aha. Ooh, a track back. That I want to approve. Not spam. You made running blog. What's this? Ooh, free HD porn video in full length. <laughs> no, let's delete that. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> right? Um, so I have some heavy duty spam plugins installed. Um, fighting spam is once your website gets popular, spam bots will attempt to go to your postings and leave comments for porn, right? So, I mean, Shrod, you can keep those up if you want to, <laughs> right? No pun intended. No pun intended. Right. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, but uh, so one of the plugins that I installed to combat the level of spam that I got on my school site is this cookies for comments one. So basically, I can't remember exactly how it works, but uh, it sets a cookie and, I don't know, on the computer or something, it has to deal with how much time somebody is actually on the page. In other words, a bot hits your thing and it's gone, right, versus you actually leaving a comment on my site to turn in an assignment you're on that page for like 20, 30 seconds or so, right? So uh, I have a plugin uh, to do that. Um, this Google XML sitemaps plugin is a plugin that I recommend. Um, I don't recommend using uh, like the all-in-one or the SEO Yoast, Yoast SEO plugins. I'll teach you how to do your own search engine optimization without a plugin um, in that respect. However, this Google XML sitemaps plugin, what this does is it generates a special XML sitemap, which will help search engines actually crawl your site better. It will also communicate with the, um, the search engines like Google and Yahoo and Bing, right? So that will help up your your SEO. Like every time um, you edit content or create a new posting or do something like that, it'll notify the search engines of new content, right? So that all your site to index that that content. Yeah, you know how like uh, I mean. If you've ever published a page and then you've gone to Google and tried to search for that to see if it's in the search engine, it might not show up for a few weeks because Google might not get to your website for a few weeks, right? Because uh, whatever. But if you have a plugin like this that communicates with Google, hey, there's a new whatever, right? You know, with the white hat practices, the the kind of legal within the rules type practices. Again, I don't know exactly how it works. So the first time you plug it in, is it going 
Uh -huh. uh -huh. I think, from what I understand, yes. Okay, and then every time you make changes, but it also makes a site map in a form XML that will help the search engines actually index your site easier. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so. Um, yeah, there's a there's a book that I learned about XML sitemaps a long time ago, and and that's what led me to install that, and um, that's definitely helped out my search engine. Some other plugins that I have running, uh, all in one event calendar, right? So um, if and when you take the 210 class, and you want to then uh, your client needs some kind of event calendar, like Uh, putting these events here in the sidebar. Or my calendar um, that I have running. So those events in the sidebar are, are from this events calendar plugin. Uh, this calendar here is from the events calendar plugin. Uh, this photo of Emilio is from Web 200 right here. I know. You're not even in this class, are you? No? You're cheating, aren't you? You're learning. You're crashing. You're squatting. Okay. That's fine. I don't have to grade you, right? Okay. You're, that, that's cool. So, um, <laughs> you're going to take this though, right? Okay. So, here in this events, right, uh, what I like about this plugin versus some of the other plugins that I've used in the past is um, I do my calendar um, in my Mac iCal application, right? So what I can do then is create a category um, for school related stuff. Right? Here's what I'm saying. How many of you are married or have a significant other? Okay. For a long time, I would miss things that my wife would tell me about. We were supposed to go here today. Where were you? Or et cetera, et cetera. And we had a calendar in the bathroom that she would write stuff on. Right? That's how we used to do it, the old school way of doing it. So I said, you know what? We both have iPhones. Let's make a family calendar. So anytime there is an event, right, that she wants me to attend or I need to know about, like book club, she's going out to book club and I need to stay home with the kids, right? She'll put it on the family calendar so it shows up on my calendar. Works out great. I recommend that. That and the, the other key to a successful marriage, separate blankets. Yes. What? No way. Separate blankets. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Especially if you have a dog that sleeps in bed with you. Separate blankets. Yeah. You mean the dog has to have his own blanket? No. The, if we have one blanket that covers everything, the dog will get under that blanket and she'll overheat and start panting, and then we have to kick her out. Right? So if we have separate blankets, she can be, and this is too much, and I'm going to go too much into that kind of stuff. But here I have then a calendar feed for school, right? That I basically am uh, linking to the URL of my iCalendar feed for the category of school. And so basically I can do my calendar um, in my calendar application on uh, my laptop or on my phone or on my tablet and it'll populate and show up here within my calendar. So an application like this, a really kind of API, its own application like that, plugins are very, very useful for that kind of stuff. Plugins are not so useful for real little intricate stuff that, like I said, you can write your own function, pull data out of the database, right? But this is a pretty, 
pretty big, robust application. So if we looked at where that lives then, oh, I'd have to, I'm not going to go and get into it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get into it. But it lives in uh, the plugins folder, OK? Can we assume there's a calendar plugin to integrate? Yeah, so in other words, if you want to install any kind of a plugin, right, and test them out, um, this is where if you want to add a new plugin to do some kind of something, um, again, you'll see what featured ones, what popular ones are out there, like Contact Form 7. We're going to install Contact Form 7 today, uh, the Google XML Sitemaps one. WooCommerce, uh, TinyMCE Advanced, WP Supercache. So a lot of these are regenerate thumbnails, are those types of applications that you're not going to want to build yourself and you're going to want to use a plugin, right? So just like, um, just like the uh, themes, there are three different ways that you can install a plugin. One, you can go and just put it in your plugins folder and upload it to your server. Sometimes it'll have trouble communicating with your server and it won't show up in your dashboard for a while. We did that yesterday, right? Uh, secondly, if I wanted to, uh, and this is where I'll show you what a plugin does look like. So if we are looking at my school website here as well, Right? Gradebook. So, Gradebook is a plugin that I made from another plugin. Okay? So, if we look at my plugins in my dashboard here, you will see KB, grade, KB Gradebook and Mike's Gradebook. KB Gradebook is how I've been doing your grades forever and a day. But the only thing I didn't like about KB Gradebook is that when I went to go utilize it, the menu item for KB Gradebook was a sub-menu item under posts. That bothered me for years. Why? It's just like the couch not being parallel to the wall. It was just wrong. It rubbed me the wrong way. I wanted that menu item to be its own menu item and not tucked under the post menu, right? So what I, what I had to do was, because this plugin was written eight, nine years ago and hasn't been updated in eight or nine years, I decided that I would uh, make a duplicate of it, right, and correct the errors and then rename it and basically make it into my own plugin. So here's the thing with a plugin, right? If you look at, let's say, Akismet, right? All it is is a couple of PHP files, right? Oh, that was the Hello Dolly one. Sorry. Uh, Akismet. Um, Akismet PHP. Right? It's basically nothing more than a bunch of PHP files that use code to hook into the admin and function however they're going to function, write content to the database, so on and so forth. Right? So what I did was then, because I wanted to, so let's say it like this. What if I want to make edits to one of these plugins? <laughs> Rule number one about plugins, don't edit plugins. Because sure enough, the author will make updates and your clients will hit the update this plugin and overwrite the changes you made to said plugin. 
that happened to be on the Jet City website where we had to go back and fix it free of charge. It wasn't too much work, but still, you know. So my what I say is if you're going to use a pre-existing plugin, I don't know of any way just yet to add make additions to that plugin that will work aside from that plugin, right? Has anybody ever heard the term child theme? If you want to make additions to or modifications to one of WordPress's themes, you can do what's called a child theme. It's kind of like an appendice to that theme. So if that theme ever gets modified or updated by WordPress, that won't affect the changes you have made to it, okay? So basically the long and the short of it is you really need to be careful about modifying things that are gonna be updated because you don't want your work overwritten, especially if the client has been paying you to do that kind of work. So if it's a plugin like that gradebook one, then what I did was I wanted to basically get rid of all the widget stuff. I didn't need the widget stuff that came with the plugin. But what I wanted to do as well then was I wanted to edit how the admin menu function. So basically I removed the uh, admin menu function that put its admin menu under the post menu and stripped it away and made it into its own menu and then ran the initialization function, et cetera, et cetera. So I've modified this plugin, right? So I wouldn't want to go updating this plugin and risk having it break. But now that it's its own plugin, if anybody wanted to use this, it's not, you know, I haven't uploaded this to WordPress because, like I said, it's a gradebook plugin created for somebody else's plugin. Is that plagiarism? Yeah. So I'm giving the credit to, you know, this is my plugin created from this guy's plugin, right? You know, original author. So I'm sourcing it, right? But if I wanted to then download this, download it as a zip, in my demo here, I could then go to plugins, add new, upload, choose file, Mike's gradebook, install, installed successfully, activate plugin, and you should see the gradebook plugin here, except for Yep. Uh, I'll bet you that there was some database stuff that's not rolling. Anyway, it's working on my school site. That's all I care about. But nonetheless, I've just shown you how to download a zip file, right? Or if we deactivate this and delete it, Okay, right, we can do one of two things for what I want to do is I want you guys to install contact form seven. So let's take a look at contact form seven. So contact form seven is just what it sounds like a contact form application where here's my web 105 final exam. 
here's my 210 client survey, here's my 210 stu student survey. So this is then a plugin that basically I can set up forms through the admin panel here, right? So this plugin, a lot of plugins then have their own admin portion to the plugin where you can do a lot of, you know, it's set up, however, whatever plugin type it is, you know, this one for contact form seven or one that I'm running uh, for my YouTube feed. To press pro, right? Where if I go to settings to press, right? So you can see that in my settings menu now, I do have settings for a lot of these plugins as well. So they'll show up either in tools sometimes or settings. But basically, a lot of these plugins that have been developed by higher end plugin makers, like the all in one um, uh, event calendar, um, uh, the TubePress, Contact Form 7, right, come with their own. They write their own admin portion into WordPress, right? Like, for instance, the gradebook one, how I do my grades with you guys is. I have created classes, Web 170, 200, 202 for spring 17, and I do my grades in spreadsheets, and then once I'm done, I upload that spreadsheet to my site, and it gives you your grades. How many of you have checked your grades on my site? Great, that's using that plugin. It's been relatively useful and, and easy for me, like I said, so, but, if I want to then now uh, go to plugins, and I've already shown you how you can go download a plugin and install it, uh, upload it as a zip file, or if you're just searching for plugins, Ron, so you are saying, how do I find a plugin that does a Google, Google Calendar feed? Uh, right. Right, so if you want to say add new and you want to search there, Google, what did you search for? Google Calendar. Google Calendar. Simple Calendar. Simple Calendar. So what you can do is you can then go and install these plugins and test them and see if they work like you want and use them or not. Um, a lot of plugins, they're, they come with, or they're free, most of them are free, but um, you will all also notice, like under settings, XML sitemap, if you find something really useful and you're gonna use it, donate, right? Give them 10 or 20 bucks for it, man, you know? So, um, but let's go back to plugins and then uh, talk about how to use short code. So, spring 2017, I'm going to delete Hello Dolly because it's the dumbest plugin ever. Uh, plugins, add new, popular. Contact Form 7, install now. Installed, activate. And you'll see a calendar or a contact menu appear over here. So in the plugins list then, here it is, Contact Form 7, right? If I go to Contact Form 7 here now, and I, it comes with a default one, contact form one. You would think that they would have named it seven, not one, 
right? But it has a real simple form for your name, your email, subject, your message, send to, send to this email address. So how this one works is I'm going to copy this short code, contact form 7, ID 6, title, contact form 1, copy. I am then going to go to my pages, and right now we have a sample page. Let's go and edit that. And this is where we have visual or text. I don't like that it says text anymore. It used to say visual and code. Text is where you can see the tags and the code, right? But again, you cannot put PHP in here. So instead, what you do is you use short code, right? So contact form seven is coming with a piece of short code for that form that I created, or I'm using their default one. So if I update that page then, and I view that page, now I should have a contact form in my website. And when I get to my office, there will be a message from me. I should really send love letters to myself. I should send, yeah, I should send positive vibes. Did anybody see that name in the last few days? You could send the lyrics from the Hello Dolly. I could. I could. I didn't. It came with it. <laughs> I don't know why they're, yeah. But anyway, that's a plugin, right? So let's uh, go back and edit this page and talk about short code real quick. So, contact form one is the default contact form that comes with this plugin. <coughs> so, if you've installed this plugin, Veronica, if you've installed this plugin, you should have a label here called contact in your menu. Okay? okay? We'll take a look at that. It then has a default contact form. Here's the short code. So it's that short code that you copy and paste and put into your page. So if I go to my page, sample page, I pasted, whoops, I pasted that short code down here at the bottom. Okay? So, short code. Let's just talk about short code and it does. So if you Google WP short code, it'll go to the short code um, page in the codex. So short code is basically a way of calling a function from a page or a posting. Okay? We cannot put PHP in the text editor. So instead, what we're doing is we are using short code to say run the gallery function for gallery ID 123 size medium. So let me show you an example of how this works. So if for instance, on my business website. I wanted to add custom functionality. Like
go get this case study and this case study from the blog and put it in the page. Well, each one of these case studies has an ID associated with it or a number associated with it because it's a post object. We view page source. It is post object 141. So everybody see that? 141. So, If I'm on my services page here for graphic design and branding, and I go to my editor, here's the text. And then down here, I'm using short code. So in brackets, I'm running the case study function, and I'm passing the parameter of 442, excuse me, I'm passing the argument of 442 through the ID parameter. Okay, so again, this is where I'm essentially running a PHP function. But because I can't put PHP in here, the way you do something like that is, Get featured case study is the function. Oh, that's going to kill me right there. I updated it the other day to get a category name as well. Why do you do that to me, GitHub? I can't let that stand, Frankie. Huh? I don't know, man. But now I'm going to have to go like tab everything over so everything is lined up exactly the way I want to. And I'm going to have to. Commit it again. Those bastards. But nonetheless, get my featured case study is the function where I am then using, saying, add short code. Use short code of case study to run this function. This function takes one parameter. That parameter is the ID number of my post ID of my post. Okay, that's how you get the number. Case study ID 442, case study ID 141. So that's how you put a lot of functionality in kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, so as another example, A long time ago, I was using a plugin to go get my photos from Flickr and display them in my website. And I was really happy with it for a long time until it really annoyed me that uh, the photos, I wanted the photos to appear newest to oldest. Well, the way that the plugin and the default way of running it was oldest to newest. Okay. There was not a setting within the API to change it ascending, descending like that. The only way to do that was to on the array it was running. Who can tell me? use the reverse array function, okay? So in that plugin, I had to go find all the arrays. And again, I was going and modifying a plugin, Frankie, that would break. So what I've taken it upon myself is to then, so how this runs is, my Flickr set ID 
that Flickr set ID. So what I did then was instead of using a plugin, I wrote a function called get my Flickr set that hooked up to the um, Flickr API service to then reverse array and write out for whatever photo set I was looking for. So get my Flickr set. I then ran running a short code, my Flickr set, same thing. I am passing an ID. My Flickr set ID, right? This number? That is the, in other words, if we are here and we actually go to Flickr and we go to Premium Design Works and I have then set up albums for my different classes. So Web 200 is that set. It takes you a while sometimes or took me a while to figure out how Flickr's API worked. And once I did, it was like, oh man, that's easy. But actually understanding how it worked took me a while, right? But anyhow, we have now talked about Installing and using a pre-developed WordPress theme. Go ahead and install a pre-developed WordPress theme just for your own, you know, and then use the default one or whatever. Right? We ran through that. Plugins. What's a plugin? Tool to extend the functionality of WordPress. Installing a plugin, contact form seven. You can either download it as a zip file and upload it, you know, because you can find this under WordPress.org. Right, so if I search for contact form seven, you can take a, you can take a look at plugins and download, right? Or I just look through the admin and it pulls them from here. So get contact form seven working for you. So this is where Veronica, right? There's that, you know, put it in your page, in your sample page. Could you then modify that, create your own uh -huh. code for any other yep. and then put your own short form? Correct. Because, uh, for instance, if we, to answer your question, I have created a bunch of contact forms. So let's say the 210 client survey. If we edit this, You can see how I've made this form, right? There's the short code. Whoops. Or that's the short code. Apparently, there's two versions now. So if I go to the client survey, here it is, that form. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> so that's the short code to pull that that form. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it's the contact form plugin. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's themes and plugins. Uh, the rest of today's lab. Any any questions? Does anybody want to tell Chris uh, Cornwall anything? Uh, that was Sherrod, Chris. <laughs> nobody nobody wants to say anything to Chris Cornwall. Hey, Chris, go delete all those files. <laughs> <laughs>